Hello everybody and welcome to this talk titled When They Go High We Go Low. My name is Tal Zwick and I'm a developer at Metalbeer where we develop MirrorD. So this talk is about solving a seemingly high level problem using quite low level techniques, specifically the problem of cloud native developer experience. And more specifically we will discuss MirrorD which is a dev tool written in Rust um, that is for developing cloud native applications. Mm, MirrorD enables cluster connected but local execution of cloud native applications. And what that means and what it looks like will become clear as we move on. So as I said the high level challenge MirrorD addresses is cloud native developer experience and more specifically just being able to run your code while developing it and the solution MirrorD deploys is at the op operating system process level. Um, first we're going to talk about what MirrorD is for. Once that is out of the way we're going to take a look at some of the low level technical details of the implementation of MirrorD. And then to wrap it all up, there's going to be a short live demo of MirrorD. And during this talk, I hope you'll um, understand why we went in this very low level direction for MirrorD and also kind of how it works in general terms. So, first, what MirrorD is for. Running the code you're working on while developing is useful and helpful. And with many types of software that is a simple enough task. But often when it comes to cloud native applications that can become not so trivial at all. Um, but I believe that we shouldn't abandon useful development patterns and practices because they're harder to implement with cloud native applications. We should just develop the tooling to make them easy. But how do you run your cloud native application while developing the application? if it for example accesses um, files that only exist on the cluster or if it uses other services in the cluster over IP or if you need another service in order to generate requests to your application. And besides running your code often is good and you might not want to spend time containerizing and deploying it after every little code change you want to test out. Um, so there are multiple existing approaches to solving that problem. They don't all offer the same capabilities and they don't all result in the same kind of workflow. Uh, but other tools for example try to um, just enable remote debugging in the cloud or they're uh, for running everything locally on the development machine. The approach MirrorD takes is to enable local development with remote access. Now there are other tools like Telepresence or Gephira that also belong to the remote category. Um, a term I learned in Daniel Bryant's um, talk yesterday. Um, so but unlike those other tools MirrorD works on the process level and not on the machine or uh, maybe container level which results in a different workflow for development and it also results in some nice content for a technical talk. Um, now the idea is to have optimal development experience for running the code and for us that means really uh, just as simple as running non cloud code. So as simple as just clicking the run or debug button in your IDE or some very simple shell invocation. In the same time we want developers to be able to run with meaningful data, realistic conditions that are similar to the conditions the code will meet in production um, and also just being able to utilize existing environments. So with MirrorD developers can execute their code locally either in a sh shell or in their IDE and when the application accesses resources from the cluster it gets actual traffic and actual data from the cluster even though it's actually running directly on the developer's computer. And developers can run their code very easily and do things like stepping through breakpoints 
but still take advantage of realistic cloud environments, like maybe some shared staging environment that is maintained in the team, um, all the while being non-intrusive and not even changing the application that is currently deployed on that cluster. Now, um, MirD does that by running the software just in a simple process on the developer's machine and adding a thin layer of transparent virtualization connecting the application's I.O. points to the cluster. And the way MirrorD achieves that magical effect is by injecting a dynamic library into the application's local process and hijacking some key operations made by the application, which leads us to the next part, the cool technical details. So here we'll take a look at key steps MirrorD takes in order to hijack an application's calls and make them magically succeed even when trying to access resources that don't exist on the system it's running on, but do exist on the Kubernetes cluster the developer is working with. So the first thing we need to do is to get our code into the process's memory. The way we do it is when a user tells MirrorD to run their application, MirrorD executes that program, but first it asks the dynamic linker to also load our dynamic library into the new process's memory. You might know it as the LD preload trick on Linux. On macOS, uh, the equivalent environment variable is dyld insert libraries. And MirrorD just adds a path, uh, like the path of its dynamic library, to that environment variable. And the dy dynamic linker loads our code into the new process in addition to that process's own code. OK, so now our code is in there, but we need it to run. Just by um, virtue of being in the process, that doesn't mean our code actually runs, as the user's application um, doesn't call it as it isn't and shouldn't be aware of MirrorD. So in order to ensure our code runs, we use another feature dynamic linkers offer, which is what is sometimes called a constructor. And that is basically uh, the feature that code that is placed in a section, a specific section of a binary, will be executed on startup. So MirrorD um, just puts some code in that section of the binary, and that code gets executed directly on process start. Now, as mentioned before, uh, MirrorD is written in Rust, so that's the syntax we're seeing here right now. And Rust has this um, nice package that basically lets us just mark this section using this uh, little attribute above our function. So all we need to do in our code, in MirrorD's code, um, is to define such a function, write whenever, whatever we want to run on startup in the body of that function, and that will run when the process starts. OK, so now we have code execution. And now there's a question, what do we run? Uh, what do we use uh, that ability for? But before we answer that question, just to make, sh uh, to make sure we're all on the same page, a quick introduction into a libc. So it's the C standard library. It implements some useful low-level operations that most uh, applications need. Um, it is used indirectly by almost every programming language. So when writing Python code, you might not be aware that that code, when running, will result in calls to libc. But when running, uh, for example, file.read in Python, when that code is executed, at some point there's going to be a call to libc's read function or some other similar uh, libc function. Um, and that is the case for most programming languages with the notable exception of Go and Linux, which is why we had to do some extra work in order to also support Go and Linux, but that is a bit outside of the scope today. So this indirect call to libc means that um, most languages don't actually include, so 
programs written in most languages don't actually include syscalls directly in their code. Um, more typically, they would include calls to libc. And libc, in turn, um, makes syscalls whenever it's necessary. And that makes libc a very good choke point for us for hijacking operation does, uh, that are done by the application. Because basically, almost, or virtually every application uh, will use libc for those operations. OK, so now that we have code execution in the user's process, what we do run on startup is code that utilizes Frida to hook libc functions. Um, now, first of all, Frida, that is a dynamic instrumentation toolkit. And that means it gives us an SDK for manipulating the process's code while it's running. And what I mean by hooking is that we use Frida in order to replace the first couple of uh, binary instructions in the function's code uh, with a jump to our code. So for every such libc function we want to hook, we just define our own replacement function. We call them detours um, in our Rust code. And we use Frida in order to make sure that um, whenever the user application calls those libc functions, our detour functions will be executed instead. So what we have to do there is basically to create um, a Rust function with an identical signature um, and also notably the C calling convention. Um, and basically, yeah, whenever that libc function is called by the user application, um, our code will be executed instead. Now, the code that we put in those detours right there isn't run on startup, right? On startup, it's just the Frida code, like our code that uses Frida that makes those hooks. But whatever we put inside of those functions will only run when the user's application actually makes those calls to libc. So now, what do we do inside of those detours is, first of all, we check the configuration or flags that the user passed to mirrord. And then we decide if this operation should be carried out locally on the developer's machine or in the cluster. Um, everything is kind of configurable. So for example, um, you can tell mirrord you want to read some files locally and other files in the cluster, or um, users might want to read everything in the cluster but only write locally, et cetera. Um, so after we made this decision, um, mirrord will send the operation to an agent running in the cluster. Now, that agent is spawned just in time when uh, we start the mirrord run. And it is deleted automatically once the run is over. And basically, that agent will get that operation from the locally uh, running um, li dynamic library of mirrord. And it will perform that operation in the cloud, return the data or the results back to mirrord that will in turn uh, make it available to the unsuspecting user's application. So for example, if a user's application tries to read from a file, uh, mirrord will check the configuration. If it uh, decides that it should be read in the cluster, it will send a message to the agent in the cluster. The agent would read those bytes from the um, file system that is available to the deployed application, return those bytes back to mirrord. Mirrord will populate the uh, application's buffer with those bytes. And the application basically uh, just doesn't even know it's not running on the cloud uh, because for the application, it's uh, exactly the same effect as running in the cloud. Now, at this point, you might be wondering how we even access the deployed application's data its file system traffic, et cetera. So first, we need to know where to get the data from. Uh, for that, users can specify a target for mirrord. So that's either a pod, a deployment, or an Argo rollout, optionally with a specific container. 
Now, the most common use case for MiraD is for working on a new version of an existing microservice. And in that case, you're going to have the stable, like the current version of that application already deployed in the cluster. So that application is what you would typically use as a target for MiraD, as that's the resource, that's the application that has the data that your local application needs. OK. Now, next thing that is important to know is that our agent uh, runs on a pod on the same node as the target, or as one of the pods of the target. Um, it then joins the target's Linux namespaces. Now, here it's important to note that those are Linux namespaces that are unrelated to Kubernetes nam namespaces. And in order to read files from the target's file system, um, MiraD, the MiraD agent accesses paths relative to the target container's root path. So that was like the cool do-it-yourself way to get this data. But ever since ephemeral containers were introduced, uh, we also support just running the MiraD agent in an ephemeral container. And we'll probably be moving to make that the default. Um, so since ephemeral containers are designed, are meant to enable debugging a running container, uh, they already get all of the container's data, so they access the same resources. Um, so over there, we don't even have to do any cool tricks or anything special in order to access that data. So I mentioned uh, resources that mirror the access of the target. And for like the main ones that we uh, support are networking. So that's both incoming connections and also initiating connections. Um, and also DNS resolution in the cluster. And then there is uh, file system access and also environment variables. So zooming out a bit, we can see that the main components of MiraD are first the MiraD binary um, installed on the developer's machine, or maybe uh, also a, a plugin for their IDE. Then there's the dynamic library that is injected into the user's process. And uh, there is the agent running in the user's cloud. So the dynamic library um, hijacks the calls by the user's application, sends them to the agent. The agent sends data back to the dynamic library. The dynamic library makes that, uh, that data available to the user's application. OK, now after we've been to this uh, short journey through some of the technical details of MiraD, mm, let's see how it looks like when users use it. And for that, we have this little example set up with some custom microservices written in Go together with a Redis and a Kafka service um, all deployed in our cluster. And we'll go through a scenario of a developer that is working on the IP visit counter microservice. Um, so now let's go to Goland, work over there, and see if the Wi Fi will let us um, work with the cluster. Can you also hear me with this one? No? Can I have this one? I need both hands for typing. Does this work now? That one? OK, that one works. OK. Um, so right now we're in the Goland IDE, the JetBrains IDE for Go. And I already have the um, MiraD plugin installed on my IDE. So I have this little uh, MiraD icon that indicates that MiraD is enabled. And let's also take a look at the resources on my cluster and see that we kind of recognize uh, the same ones from that 
diagram we saw earlier. Um, so just a quick look at this application we're gonna debug. Uh, the, like the couple of functions it has here in this uh, main Go file. There is a setup Redis and setup Kafka in order to set up connections to those um, services. We have a load config um, method uh, function that loads a configuration for this application. Um, get count is kind of like the main uh, function that is going to uh, handle requests, incoming requests, HTTP requests. And there is the main function that uh, starts the server. Um, okay, so we got MirrorD enabled. I have my breakpoint here in the main function. Um, I have some very basic MirrorD configuration file, which is uh, almost like the default configuration file. And now I'm just going to hit debug and start running. Um, now, of course, What's happening right now is that MirrorD is spawning uh, an agent pod in my cluster. Um, so with bad connectivity, that might take a bit. Uh, but we're already there. So first of all, let's step into that load config function and see what that looks like. So here we can see that the application um, uses Viper, so a Go package, in order to populate the fields of a config object with values it gets from environment variables. Now, I actually don't have those environment variables defined on my machine, also not in this uh, launch configuration. But if we step through and go to the kind of like the end of this function, we can see that the config was successfully populated with values that um, came from those environment variables. And the reason for that is that MirrorD fetched those environment variables from the cluster and made them available to my application here. Okay, so if we step out, we can see that now the application uses those values from the environment variables, so like the values in the configuration, in order to do the next operations. So first of all, it's going to read a file from a path that pa was passed in this configuration. Um, and right here we can kind of like do a little verification and see that this path, of course, doesn't actually exist on my system. But when the when this application reads that path, uh, it, it actually succeeds and it gets data. Um, and of course, we now know that this data came from the cluster. The application doesn't know it, right? Like it doesn't, it isn't aware of MirrorD, um, but it's just like it's running in the cluster and has access to that file system. Okay. Next thing, the application is going to set up a connection to Redis. We're going to step in. And we can see that it uses another value from, conf from the configuration as the Redis host. Mm, now, also there, right, if I just try to connect to that uh, Redis host directly from my machine without using MirrorD, um, curl is going to tell me that it can't even um, resolve that host. And that makes sense because that name is like internal to the cluster. But the application is able to create the connection, so it's able to uh, resolve the, the host and also like to send uh, Redis ping. And that is, of course, because both of those operations happened, were carried out in the cluster. So both DNS resolution and um, initiating an outgoing connection to that Redis service. OK. Moving on, I'm going to skip over that. Uh, Setup Kafka function because it's uh, really probably very similar to that setup Redis function. And the next thing the application does is to define the two routes it's going to handle. So one is for the health checks defined on the cluster, and the other is the like main one, the actual one that is going to handle. So let's just let the application start and start receiving requests. And if I go over to that console, I can see that. We can already see incoming health checks from the cluster. Um, and if we go over to the terminal, sorry, we can also generate a request to the cluster, right? So it's not to localhost, it's to um, the actual cluster um, exposed in the internet. And I'm going to generate that request. 
and we can see that my local breakpoint uh, was hit because we already forwarded that, uh, that request to my local application and now I can basically step through this function and see how my application handles a real request that was actually sent to the cluster. Now if I go back to um, the terminal again, um, so this response that curl received here was actually not generated by my local application but by the remote request, a remote application and that is because in its default mode of operation um, MirrorD just mirrors the traffic from the cluster to the local application which means um, it duplicates that traffic, sends it over to the uh, local license of MirrorD and um, it is actually the remote application that handles <laughs> that handles um, those requests. Um, there is also a steal mode where MirrorD like steals that application away from the remote uh, application and for that there is also HTTP filters in order to steal only some of the requests. For example, you only want to steal requests uh, that you generated and not teammates or maybe you don't want to steal all of those um, health check requ um, requests because they're not interesting for your debugging. Um, okay, so that's that. Um, I'm going to go back to the presentation. That will take a second. Okay. Nice. Okay. So, yeah, I think we still have a, bit, a little bit of time. So, let's look at another very low level challenge we had to overcome in order to create MirrorD. Um, so, at one point, I mentioned injecting a dynamic library on macOS. But this is actually not at all as simple as it is on Linux. So, in order to demonstrate that, uh, or yeah, to show that challenge, this is like the um, minimal example for injecting code, right? So, we have um, on the left side a very simplistic binary. Uh, it's a Rust code that I compiled to a binary called hello binary. And in the right side, a code that I compiled into a dynamic library that prints a line on startup. Now, if we just run that binary by its own, this is what it looks like. This is to be expected, right? Um, and once we inject that dynamic library, we see both of those prints. And that is basically like this very simple principle is the same method of injection that MirrorD uses. But now, uh, what happens if I try to run some other program, maybe in a non compiled language like Python? And reminder, this is all only on macOS. Um, so, what happens when I try to inject that same uh, library into that code? So, now that we can see that it doesn't work, right? We only see the print uh, of that original application, and we don't see the print uh, from our dynamic library. So, it means that injection failed. Now the reason this happens um, is basically uh, because of a security mechanism on macOS put in place by Apple where, where when a binary, binary meets some uh, set of not very documented criteria, um, this environment variables, uh, this environment variable is not respected and is also stripped off of any of the descendant processes of this run. Um, now, over here what I ran was like a Python script, right? Um, and you wouldn't expect it to be protected by those criteria and you'd be right um, because this Python script I used in, as an executable right here is not the actual binary 
that is executed, right? Because when we have this script, we have to look at the shebang. That's like the hash exclamation mark in the first line. And this is what determines what, ex uh, what binary is going to be executed. In this case, it's just env, and env receives uh, Python 3 as an argument. So env will decide what binary to execute next, um, re like uh, depending on that argument. And for many tools, for many inter interpreters, that doesn't even end that. So uh, for many Python distributions or Node distributions, um, just running a script results in a very long chain of executions. So like first you actually um, execute env, env executes some uh, script that then uh, searches for, for the right installation on your system that then executes env again <laughs> and env will then like find it, it, at the end of this point uh, the right binary so like in this case some python binary will be found and will be executed so what happens in this situation is that env is that binary that is protected by apple or by the mechanism on macOS. And this is why injection doesn't work in this case. But of course, we do want to support um, all languages also on macOS. Um, so we, di we did have to like, find a solution for that. And while the complete solution is quite involved and complicated, um, and you can, if you're interested, you can see it in our code on GitHub, or uh, also we wrote a blog post about it. But in very general terms, in very simple terms, um, what we do is we first extract um, just the binary code out of the executable binary. We then write it into a new file. We sign it on the go. And we basically run that new file instead of the old one. And now you might remember that, um, yeah, we many files or like many runs are actually like chains of executions of multiple binaries. So in order to um, also support that, we hook another libc function uh, called execve, so that we can do all of that process on the go every time um, a binary executes a new binary. Okay. So that was a quick tour through the internals of MirrorD. Um, MirrorD has a lot more interesting implementation details and also cool features that I didn't have time to go into today. Uh, but if you're interested, please just uh, check out our code on GitHub or our website. And now that you've seen how easy it is to just uh, test out, I hope you'll try it out and let me know what you think. And I also recommend joining our Discord for live MirrorD support and questions, or also just to chat. And um, if you have any questions or want to talk to me personally, uh, please just feel free to uh, come to me after the talk and say hi or anytime. Um, also, I have some limited amount of MirrorD and Melbourne swag with me. If anyone's interesting, uh, just come to me after the talk. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. Um, I think we might have time for like a couple of questions. Yeah, so we do have time for a couple of questions. So yeah, if there are any questions, we can do that now. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, thanks for the, the talk, really nice. Um, how does the traffic from the cluster flow into, into the application running on your laptop? I don't think you went through that part. Right. So the, when the start runs, MirrorD first uh, spawns the agent um, in the cluster, and then it creates a connection with that agent. Um, now that connection is basically based on uh, port forwarding to, into the cluster. So MirrorD, like, um, yeah, just Creates, creates kind of like a TCP connection directly with the um, agent that runs in the cloud. And then like uh, communicates with the agent in its own protocol. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the talk, very interesting. Um, the question is, that sounds fantastic. Uh, is there any reason why this would not work 
for specific use cases. Mirordi. Sir. Oh, any use cases that wouldn't work? Yes. Um, yeah, so there, there are some edge cases. So first of all, um, like the most obvious or like basic one, um, we do it by hooking libc functions. So if you were to write your like own assembly code that directly does sys calls and doesn't uh, include any libc codes, um, any libc calls, then like you couldn't uh, use MirrorD with that. Um, yeah, I guess we don't even try to support that. Um, there are static binaries. So because uh, the whole thing uh, is like, the, or the, the whole mechanism is about, uh, is built around injecting dynamic libraries, um, static binaries are, um, yeah, not good, like that, it's not gonna work for, for static binaries, uh, but I think there are like uh, simple enough workarounds for that. Um, like maybe just forcing um, a dynamic library, like a dynamic uh, binary build. And I think we might have, like if there are other cases, I think we probably already have them documented on our website. And if we don't, we uh, welcome contributions also to the documentation. Hey. Yeah. yeah. Good talk. Uh, hey. Is the mirror this solution for the local machine is bounded by uh, Linux or Mac uh, only, or is it also Windows enabled? So for Windows, um, you can run it over WSL. Um, WSL, so uh, Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, yeah, I think like we, we might like one day also have like kind of like more native support in Windows. Um, like um, that would be like, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> yeah, we, we accept contributions on that, on that issue. I think it's like a very popular issue on GitHub, but like the one the team is most uh, afraid of, <laughs> of ever being prioritized. So yeah. Okay. Another one? Okay. Hi. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask the same question, but on top of that, um, uh, do you have any idea to support bare metal or it's only about Kubernetes? Um, are you asking because of the name or? Uh... <laughs> oh, no, actually no. not. Okay. Um, I think right now we, we only support uh, like Kubernetes and also maybe like uh, similar solutions, like similar distributions, right? Um, but I, I'm not aware of any like plans for bare metal, but feel free to suggest it on GitHub, ask it on Discord. Yeah. Yo. Uh... So glibc has version sim build. So what happens if I call a symbol that is uh, not available for its version in the pod that you spawn on Kubernetes? What happens in the case? Um, so the libc hooks all, all, like happen on locally. They're they're not like they don't happen on, in the cloud at all, right? The, they're Sorry, did I misunderstand the question? That's not my question. Um, in my glibc, locally, the symbols are versioned. And they can be newer than on a remote host. Um, okay, so basically, um, with, like, we implement the operations, um, not like one-to-one. -one. So the uh, operation that the agent carries out on the cluster is not just run that exact same libc. There is some level of, of, of abstraction. So basically, um, it would still work. Uh, like also in the, like it doesn't depend on the libc versions being the same or whatever. Yeah. I have uh, two questions. Um, is this particular to the, the GNU libc or also uh, supports muscle or the other libc implementations? Um, which oh like which version of libc or yeah just is it just the, the GNU version or does it also support muscle oh um, actually I'm not sure like do you know how sorry it, I, yeah it should also work with older ones um, okay but okay. yeah if it doesn't please let us know uh, but like it should be supported we're not aware of like any problem with older libc versions okay and the traffic that's forwarded between the Kubernetes cluster and local uh, your local application is that encrypted in any kind or um, right yeah so like it's works over port forwarding so um, like by the same encryption of uh, the kubectl port forwarding 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Cool. Okay, we're out of time for today. Uh, if you have any more questions or just want to uh, say hi or secure some swag, just uh, let me know.